We saw all three local kinds of uh, mergansers. Oh. Saw eared grebes, a uh, whole bunch of different ducks. So you're a bird person too then, Jim? Not really, just other than we go out once in a while to, to East Souk because it's a nice place to go. And this weekend there was all kinds of birds around. It was really busy. These people, these people were obvious birders. They had their big telescopes and they were busy counting. <laughs> but, uh, also, trick vehicle people. Hmm. Yeah. Have, have you been out to the East Souk, Carrie? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, many times, many times. Yeah. Mostly have on you... my motorcycle when I had a motorcycle. Oh, it's yeah. A great place for riding motorcycles. Yeah. There's all little roads. Now, here's a trivia question. How fast can a merganser duck fly? Not as fast as a peregrine falcon, that's for sure. I don't know. You'll be surprised. 81 miles an hour. That right. Holy smokes, that's a fast duck. That's, that's a pretty quick bird. We used to watch the peregrines uh, when I was working in Edmonton. We, we for several years there, we were on the top on the fourteenth floor of uh, one of the buildings there, just opposite the University Hospital. And all over there is where they had a, a nesting pair of peregrines every year. Mm -hmm. So we'd go down to the cafeteria on the twelfth floor, and he'd be sitting there, and you'd watch feathers coming down past the window from the peregrines who'd picked off a pigeon and were eating it on the 14th floor. <laughs> yeah. They used to nest in Edmonton at a tree in my brother's backyard and boy are they noisy. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and messy. And messy. Yeah, they are not good neighbors. <laughs> Yeah, the other place we went with our ducks is my daughter's here, so we we went up to Queen's Pond. I don't know if you know about Queen's Pond, mm -hmm. but it's at the very north end of the Cedar Hill Golf Course. And uh, if you take a, a little bit of cracked corn <laughs> and feed the ducks, you will be surrounded by hundreds of ducks. <laughs> if you need to put a smile on your face, you just go feed the ducks at Queen's Pond. <laughs> They'll be overrun by if you uh, give them. Oh, yeah, there's hundreds of ducks there. Hmm. I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. You, you can usually see uh, wood ducks there. That's uh, Yeah, all kinds of wood ducks. Uh, and I, I've always known it as King's Pond. Maybe that's an older name for it. <laughs> I, I know it as King's Pond as well. But there are two ponds there, so you never know. Maybe one's Queen's Pond and one is King's Pond. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, it's, it's at the north end of the uh, Cedar Hill Golf Course anyway, which is yeah, in my neighborhood. Yeah, we saw, saw some ring neck ducks as well as the wood ducks and some green winged teals. Boy, you're good at this. There well, another, I just say there goes another duck. Well, being a, being a prairie boy growing up in Calgary, we used to, my dad used to take us out for Sunday drives and we go out to all the, around all the sloughs and look for different birds. I'm not a birder per se. I like looking at birds. But That's what I, mean. I don't keep track. We'll just get started in a moment or two. Good, good evening, everyone. I have the recording on. Thank you, Joe. Now that you're recording, Joe, nobody wants to talk. Well, it looks like we're stable at uh, 29 participants have checked in. So um, welcome to uh, RAS Victoria Centre Astro Cafe for uh, February the 1st. Um, I realize I should probably say who I am, although I think most, hopefully most people know who I am. I'm um, Chris Purse. I'm the membership coordinator and uh, one of the people who hosts this event. 
Um, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, a reminder that we're accepting nominations for uh, a new council that will be elected in uh, three weeks. And nominations, this is about the last call possible for nominations for center awards that will be presented at the AGM in three weeks. A uh, reminder that we do have a few calendars left, uh, the 2021 RASC um, calendar, and those are available. Um, Laura, you still have yours, I believe, and I have some, one. I have, I have four. Okay, so we have a total of five available if anybody's looking for uh, one of those. Um, I, I, maybe uh, in just a moment, I'll ask if anybody has anything they want to present tonight, but the first thing I'd like to present is uh, this. I'll just share my screen. Um, this is from the uh, uh, national website and it's the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. And I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, newest uh, recipient of a certificate, um, Randy Enkin. So this is a, a fairly challenging, I would say, uh, moon observing um, program it is, is quite a few fairly obscure targets there. Maybe Randy could say a few words about how long it took and whatever, but uh, he's the second member of our center to have completed this and only the 24th overall, as I understand it right now. So uh, congratulations, Randy, and I understand your certificate and pin are on its way to you. So, and I have started work on a presentation to get for Astra Cafe. So I won't steal that thunder, but uh, yeah, it was um, shy of two years to uh, do the project from March till the following November. And it was great fun. And I highly, highly recommend it. So thank you for uh, putting that out. And so when, when the pin comes, then we'll do a uh, some sort of virtual presentation, I guess, and I'll That'll be great. Have a proper talk at that time. I do have one picture of what I did Friday night uh, to present. Okay. It, it's not too busy otherwise. Yeah, no, I, I nobody had contacted me with anything. So, um, and I know we have some photographs from Edmonton, um, which I, I believe uh, Reg can show and Randy can tell, or um, Dave can tell us about. Um, does anybody else have anything they wanted to talk about or show? Um, Chris, uh, a fellow named uh, Perry McDonald approached me and he received a, a telescope and he's been frustrated uh, trying to get it going. So I invited him to join Astro Cafe. He might show up and uh, he might be able to explain this problem. And I'm sure that somebody would be able to help him out here on our, our forum tonight. So. I'll keep an eye out for them. Yeah. Chris, uh, just a comment uh, on the SIGs. Uh, I understand um, uh, astrophotography SIG was uh, a roaring success uh, last week. And uh, tomorrow we have the beginners SIG. And then on Thursday we have electronically assisted astronomy. Yeah, so just to recap, we're, um, we're starting some special interest groups. Um, and we have a potential of, I guess, what is it for at the moment, David? Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's four. Um, I think uh, Jim was thinking about, um, well, actually, Jim's going to bring online the makers group. So that'll be coming soon. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, John, did you want to say a few words about uh, your meeting last week? Yeah, I, uh, I can do that. It was, uh, I wasn't quite sure what would happen, but we ended up with a nice, pretty even split between people that were fairly experienced and people that were, you know, looking for help either getting started or, or coming on a bit. And I thought we had quite a nice discussion. Uh, I think there were 10 people there and I've had another request to join since from a fellow up in Qualicum Beach who was willing to come down here for the meetings and I let him know that that wasn't necessary uh, because it's on Zoom. So we'll be meeting again uh, the next meeting. Let me just look at my calendar. To I believe it's on the 24th, if I remember my dates correctly, but I could be wrong. 24th, Wednesday, the 24th, that's correct. And the third, or sorry, the fourth Wednesdays of each month after that. 
Yeah. So again, if you um, if you're interested in that, there is information on the website, including contact information, and John is the contact person for that uh, particular group. And so again, we're looking at having a beginners group, an electronic assisted astronomy group, and a makers group. Great. Um, anything further, David? As you're kind of coordinating the overhead overall effort. Uh, no, not really. I. I... I'm looking forward to them for sure. And uh, a lot of the people can't always make the beginners groups, but I've also suggested to people, if they have questions to ask, they can certainly send us email. We'll put somebody in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah, um, somebody uh, had contacted me about uh, getting some assistance. So um, hopefully that's uh, in the works now. Um, certainly it's a bit of a challenge at the moment, but um, you know, with some precautions, I think, um, uh, a meetup is possible outdoors somewhere, assuming the weather cooperates with it. Um, but we just need to be careful. Um, okay, so that's what I had. So, um, Randy, did you want to tell us about uh, what you've been up to other than earning that very wonderful certificate? Well, mostly complaining about the, uh, the weather. Um, my daughter caught me actually looking at a website, which was... I don't know, I Googled what astronomers do, amateur astronomers do when it's cloudy. She thought it was pretty funny that there's even websites that talk about that sort of thing. And one of the things they said is join your local amateur astronomy club, which I heartily agree with. And the other one, they said, process your photos if you're an astrophotographer. Anyway, on Friday, the heavens opened up for a little bit. Before I finished this drawing, it was getting pretty, pretty cloudy. So I didn't get all of the shading that I wanted to, but this is one of my favorite views, the uh, often called the gang of four, but I don't like the uh, implications of that. So I'm doing my own little um, program of trying to get people to call it the famous four. So that's, uh, let me see, Langrinus, Vendelinus, Octavius and Frenarius. I think it's very poetic. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a very lovely alignment close to the east limb of the, uh, the moon. The, these four uh, craters of very vastly different age. Um, you can see how er eroded Vendelinus is. By the way, this picture was taken in Toronto. I love it when I can uh, compared to a picture that's taken more locally, but um, not that night. So uh, this is from Toronto. Stephen Arthur Sweet has a very good collection of uh, pictures most days that he can see them in Toronto. Uh, a wonderful thing with Patavius is it's got this kind of um, rift going out at uh, three o'clock. So that, it's, it's a, really impressive young crater compared to Vendelinus that's so old. Anyway, lovely scene and just a pleasure to get the telescope out in these troubled days when it's cloudy all the time. Did anybody else see take out their telescope this last week? Not a soul. No. <laughs> I was in the back of the car all week, but it never got clear enough. <laughs> I did have a look out the window a few times to see what I could see, but uh, I didn't actually set up a telescope. So. But uh, well done. So does anybody have anything else to say? So, or I, are we at Reg already? <laughs> um, Chris? Yes. We had a uh, an email from a young per a, a mother actually kind of up in uh, Duncan who works with the who works with a, a school that is online at this point and uh, she was wondering whether or not there was anybody that um, could be a mentor for a young person who was doing just a, a school project on uh, black holes and um, you know things like that in the middle of our galaxy and I wondered whether or not there was anybody that had had a little bit of time that might um, that might want to 
do some mentoring of a of a young person. So I'm just I'm putting that out there, and if anybody would like to, they can get a hold of me, and um, uh, and I can I can uh, give you to the um, to the um, to the mom mom and the young child. Yes, I, I don't know how young. I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not sure, but obviously, if doing something like that, they'll need. They just wanted somebody to talk to and uh, get some information from. So, all of you black hole people out there, let me know. Thanks. Um, Malcolm asked a question, so you should not have a line through your mute to speak. Um, yeah, thanks, Laurie, and uh, we'll certainly um, yeah reach out to Laurie if um, you uh, if you would like uh, to take that on. Um, does anybody else have anything at this point? So we seem to be didn't have a pre presentation tonight. <laughs> Chris, I don't I don't have an astronomy picture, but I do have a picture that some of you might find interesting that I got just this week. Yeah, please go ahead. So it's not astronomy, but. Uh, I'll just share the screen and show you. Yeah. I don't know if you could see, can you see that? Yep. Yes, we can. Looks I a bit disheveled. <laughs> a building with a visitor on top. Yeah, yeah this, uh, he looks like a rather bedraggled eagle. But he, uh, he landed on the building near us and I shot a few pictures of him. And then he flew down to another building and I took some more pictures. And uh, hmm. first time I've seen one here. I remember the peregrine falcons in Edmonton too, but I didn't ever get a, a good picture of them. That's anyway, beautiful, that, John. Great shot. Are those the ones there to stop the birds from landing? I think that's what they're for. I thought it was kind of interesting. That <laughs> it didn't have any effect on him at all. This is looks like he's been, it looks like he's been in a fight, I think, with uh, other eagles. It well, sure looks like he's been through some kind of a ringer. I wonder yeah, they, are, they often fight down at the shoreline over food. So uh -huh. that's probably, that's probably another what's happened. It's, uh, it's possible that the juvenile as well, they, uh, they don't get their full adult colors. Uh, and it's a little dark like that uh, for a while. Yeah. Looks as though his feet have got a, a wavelength that is much larger than the wires. So it just goes right over top of them. True. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's another one. And you can see his wings are certainly in not the greatest shape. He's homeless. <laughs> oh, that's all I've got. I just thought you might be interested since there's not a lot of other stuff being shown. We can show at least this is stuff in the sky, so or related to the sky. Yeah, I find that wire pattern uh, fascinating. I wonder what they were trying to do with that. That must be it, I guess. John, it might be a piebald bald eagle. Oh, really? Maybe that, wire is a, right, uh, bits. maybe that wire is a uh, an antenna, eh, Chris? I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one up there. <laughs> or maybe he's a leucistic bald eagle. I think it's more likely a Not juvenile. Right. We have a bald eagle's nest in, right close to our house, and we see them flying by all year. And he's transitioning from uh, juvenile feathers to adult feathers is what's happening there. At about two years old, yeah. they get their white head and black sides. I thought, I thought some of you might know more about birds than I do and could tell us some stuff. So that's great. And there's a, there's a nest in Saks Point Park too. So we've watched generations grow up. There's one bald eagle down at uh, Beacon Hill Park that's adopted the top of the totem pole as his perch. 
good view from there, I'm sure. You can keep an eye on things. Great. So has anybody else got anything to share? <laughs> That's a neat photo, pair of photos. I don't know about you, Chris, but there's quite a few people that I don't know that I'm kind of reluctant to say, who are you and what do you do? So if anybody's new, it'd be great for them just to pipe up and say who they are and where they're from and what they like to do sort of thing, but I don't want to pigeonhole anybody. Sure, that'd be great if, if anybody wants to, if, it, if anybody's here for their first evening. Hey. Well, I'm, <clears throat> this is my first Astro Cafe. I keep not putting them on my calendar. And then when I do put them on my calendar, I don't look at the calendar. So uh, yeah, sorry about that. I have been to a few meetings. I moved here from uh, Edmonton three years ago now, just a shade over three years ago when, after I retired. Um, moved to Sydney to be closer to the grandkids who are in Vancouver and one in Colwood. Um, and recently took up um, amateur radio, got a license in September and I've been playing with equipment. Today I was struggling with uh, a Linux configuration for a, a SDR radio program that I can connect to my little HF radio and it shows wonderful waterfalls and things. But, mm. I sort of have it working, but it doesn't show the frequency properly. <laughs> At least the sound comes out and the waterfall comes down. Chris knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, there's a few amateur radio operators here, so that's uh, it's a good um, crossover. <laughs> uh, VE7DAO here. Yeah. So yeah, Mike and I were at a, um, a Zoom event on uh, Saturday morning for the uh, amateur radio club locally. So that was, uh, that was interesting, so. So Malcolm, you got yourself a pretty nice call sign there. VE7AO? Yeah, yeah VE7Delta Alpha Oscar, yep. Well, how about that? You like my other call sign though, it's a uh, Victor Alpha 7 India Sierra Sierra. Oh, really? Wow. ISF? <laughs> Are you breaking in? To say something. Yep. Uh, this is Miles, PE7GLX. That's Galaxy without the vowels, GLX. <laughs> oh, I like that. Dave, you were trying to tell us something too. Oh, uh, am I on mute? No. Um, yeah, I'm a immigrant from Calgary. Um, <laughs> new, new, new to this chapter, and actually fairly new to us astronomy it's uh um was a lifelong summit sort of ambition but uh never had time for and uh impressed with the the technology that's come about since i was a kid <laughs> obviously and um trying to grab the bull with two horns i'm interested in observing and uh um and uh astrophotography and uh, getting to know people. So mm -hmm. that's great. So I jump in and see what's what and see what the Astro Cafe is. I'm interested in the special interest group. So I'm going to check out the website to see um, if, if I guess it's open for, for members to join, whoever's interested. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, join more than one if you wish. You can always uh, sort of be a bit of a dilettante and go from sig to sig and see which one you really like. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got some really nice equipment up on the hill that we'll someday get to use, and you could be part of that too. Yeah, I've heard about it. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true of many of us because, uh, yeah, we've had um, uh, two new telescopes, two new to us anyways, telescopes, uh, installed up there and I don't think there's actually too many members of the club who've seen them in person yet because <laughs> what's been going on but uh, we are uh, once we start getting some clear evenings we should be able to get smaller groups back up there so yeah, oh, well, yeah when, when COVID runs its course we'll eventually start up our summer star parties again 
Oh, I'm really looking forward Have to it. that. Perhaps I'll just uh, share Dan's uh, photographs. He, oh, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, our our uh, observatory technical committee are the people who keep the observatory running, and it's obviously a difficult task right now. But we have managed to uh, acquire a new telescope, and we have installed it as of yesterday up at the VCO, which is Victoria Center Observatory. So for those of you who aren't on the observers active observers list, um, which is the list that uh, one of our members shared these photos with. I'll share them with the rest of you. If I can figure out how to do it. Here we go. So it's um, this this telescope here is new, and it is a. Um, 140 millimeter Apple refractor Takahashi. It's a beautiful telescope, which we acquired from a, a member of ours uh, from Port Alberni who didn't, uh, wasn't going to be using it anymore. And so we've managed to put it on the uh, mount uh, up in our observatory. You can see another shot here. This scope here is the um, 12 and a half inch uh, Richie Kretchen telescope we have on the mount. And this is the new refractor here beside it. And this is our Paramount ME, which is a beautiful um, uh, go-to mount with uh, fantastic tracking. And uh, so we've got all the bells and whistles up there. Obviously we still have to configure this setup, um, but at the moment it certainly could be used for visual and uh, casual astrophotography. Um, this is the inside of the observatory, just so you can see what it looks like uh, with the paramount on our pier. Um, yeah, we got a little bit of tidying up to do with the cables by the looks of it, but it's all in place, which is kind of nice. So I just thought I'd share that. And if you need, if you need to... Um, if you need to become an active, if you if you decide to become an active observer, uh, that really term is really used to allow people to go up on Observatory Hill, which is National Research Council property. So we have to follow a few rules. It means you have to sign up to the email list, receive notifications of when an observing session happens, and then show up if you wish to. And in order to get on the list, you can talk to Chris Purse, and he can put you on the actual observers list. There's very little formality to to in that process, but there's a little bit of you just have to read the rules basically. Um, just maybe for the benefit of um, some of the newer members too. So, in addition to that equipment, we also have a um, twenty inch Obsession telescope, which is um, was donated. Uh, I think from an estate, um, Reg can correct me on that, which, and that is a very um, nice telescope for uh, visual work as well. So we, we have, um, and right beside the observatory is a uh, concrete expanse um, where you can put, set up equipment too. So there is some space there. Um, at the moment, we are limited to how many people can be there, but you know, normally there could be a group of, you know, perhaps as many as 10 people there with various pieces of equipment. Maybe Reg, you could just mention the obsession. Okay. With power? Uh, well, sorry. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Mike and uh, Dave uh, to the group. Uh, uh, I uh, am not an ac active amateur radio, but I was Victor Yankee, one alpha Yankee. And uh, that was when I was in the Yukon, different uh, uh, um, signature there, hot, hotly sought after by some. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Francois Pilo, who uh, was an active member in the Victoria area, and then he moved up to um, uh, the Courtney, the Comox Valley, and he's still very active up there. Uh, he, uh, I've been in touch with him of late, and uh, he has got a uh, a fairly high quality 
mount uh, for sale. It's a Celestron mount, but it's got a rating of over 90 pounds and it's uh, in very good shape. And if anybody is interested in uh, pr uh, upgrading to a, uh, a really high grade mount, uh, please give me a call and I'll, I'll connect you up with Francois. He's asking, I believe it's over $2,000 for this. This is over a $4,000 mount. So it's a, it's a really robust thing. So uh, keep it in mind. Um, and I think I'm gonna attempt to screen, uh, share the screen and see what we got here. And I'll go to the Victoria Center. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is that uh, Jim Hasser sent me this neat link here. And um, uh, it's a family portrait of the neighborhood. And um, I just wanted to show you this picture. This was taken by the Solar Orbiter, which is going into all sorts of exotic directions to get very close to the uh, sun and possibly get above the plane of the earth. And so it's gonna do a lot of flybys of uh, Venus. So this is quite a remarkable picture when you think about it, because this is not Stellarium or some sort of modeling thing. This is actually a photo of Mars, Earth and Venus taken uh, uh, mm -hmm. last uh, um, November. Um, so uh, I just thought I'd put that in there and they actually have it. Um, you can see see the uh, planets moving be uh, relative to the background uh, skies there, and if you want to find out more about uh, the solar orbiter, they've got a nice little write up here on this thing. So if you've got a moment, click on that link, and um, I thanks Jim to Jim for sharing that with me. I enjoyed looking at that. Um, now uh, the boys in Edmonton did not disappoint, uh, and um, uh, uh, the our new member from Edmonton, uh, you have got to realize that there's been an insurrection and the Edmonton Center is taking over our center. And we often feature through the thank, uh, thank uh, we, the kindness of um, Dave Robinson, who recently came from Edmonton and left his heart there. Um, we have these beautiful pictures and one, this one was taken by Alistair Ling a man who never sleeps and he's always up and he's getting all these beautiful uh, uh, signature pictures of the skyline with objects in it. And this was uh, a moon set uh, on Friday. And you can see that uh, uh, very cold air uh, blowing off, uh, uh, shooting all the moisture uh, uh, to the south from a north wind up there. So it's a frosty Friday morning, but this next picture I'm really excited about. Now this is a picture that uh, Abdu Anwar uh, took. He has been very active and we've seen a lot of his pictures. This is the International Space Station that he took this picture. And he writes, uh, after several years and many attempts, I finally managed to get a shot of the ISS where it was not a blurry mess. <laughs> I actually, uh, identify individual model, modules of the space station. Now uh, that I've worked out uh, the settings a lot uh, by trial and error, I can focus on actually imaging the station. Um, so what he did is he used his trusty Celestron C8 uh, on a manual alt azimuth mount. And I guess he just uh, traced it along and he had his uh, Fuji X-T2 uh, camera to make a video of this and capture the frames. But I, I think that's pretty exciting. So he's dropped the gauntlet. I think uh, some people here should try and, and do the, uh, the same or maybe even try and sketch it as it goes by. Uh -huh. At any rate, I was pretty impressed. And, and um, I don't know if you're in contact uh, with Abdur at, at all, Dave, but just please relay uh, my impressions that this was a great achievement. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll send him a note. Okay, thank you. That's an amazing picture. Yeah, it is. So, and track, a, if you can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, another person that um, uh, Dave has talked about is uh, Roman. And this is Roman at work uh, in his garage, and he's uh, fashioning uh, 
uh, uh, components for the monster mega project in Edmonton, a 32 inch telescope and um, as a reflector. And I think this is a friction drive wheel here. And Dave, you want to join into it, but I do want to show you, I got quite excited about this because this is a piece of stainless steel on the outside rim and uh, iron on the inside. Is that correct, Dave? That, that's correct. And he's, this is, uh, he, he tack welded this on, onto the, he, he cut out or he had, had his machine shop that he's working with Edmonton fabricators uh, make, make the pieces. Then he tack welded the, he did a lot of research first to figure out what material to use that could withstand the stresses between the drive wheel and the, the roller. And they could be as high as 60 to 80,000 PSI. Mm -hmm. So he, 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 he tried contacting some of the manufacturers that build these big commercial scopes, but they weren't very forthcoming on how you do this or what materials to use. He eventually talked to uh, the, the maintenance department at one of the major observatories, uh, Las Cumbres Observatories, and got some back, back of the envelope information on what to use. He ended up with uh, a stainless steel that's being welded on to the rim of that mild steel. And of course the stainless, it's four special 410 stainless, which required a, a special procedure to actually weld the two pieces together. He, uh, he, the guy at Ed, Edmonton Fabricators worked that out for him. Um, and then they, they welded it together, but it needs to be heat treated so that the uh, stainless will, will, will have those, those uh, extend those pressures. And yeah, on heat- Can I just uh, stop you right there, Dave? Yep. Uh, now for a drum roll. <laughs> oh yeah. And this is on, an next picture. <laughs> yeah. On, <laughs> I got on, quite excited about this. On heat treating, when they quench the, the heat treating because it requires a heating and then quenching to get that hard steel, the- <laughs> rim shrunk <laughs> and of course it buckled the hell out of the internal wheel. It's out, no, he said here, it's out by one and a half inches. It, it buckled in the middle. Yeah, you can so see that. He, he figured you wouldn't be, they have a big press at Edmund Fab and he, they, they figured you might be able to press it flat, but not as it sits. So he wanted to cut the center portion of the wheel out. And he said he was, quite concerned when he did it because he was worried that the hoop stresses would let go with a bang. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't. He got it cut out. And if you show the next one. Why, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't do that one uh, because I okay. didn't quite understand what I was looking at myself, so. Okay, well, on, on the next one, he, it, uh, he cut, out, cut out the center portion and they took it initially back uh, to the to Edmonton Fab and they pressed it flat he's going to build some stuff to connect the parts that were cut out. Um, but it, it, it's now, it's now at least flat, but in pressing it, they got a little bit of a twist in the, in the wheel as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's out by right now. Uh, what do you say here? It's out by a quarter inch. There's about a quarter inch twist in it, but he's thinking if they can get it back into the machine shop, uh, he'll be able to get that, uh, that twist, eighth, it'll be down to an eighth of an inch and he should be able to machine that one eighth inch out. Uh, so this is quite the process. He started this whole business of assembling the wheel in August and the last picture that we got this uh, was sent to me on January the 25th. So he says, things don't always go as you expected. Now I'm only five months behind schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's amazing Dave so kudos to Roman just just as a background in case you didn't know uh, Roman is he he started his uh, his career as a professional he started off at university in honors physics and he decided that after the first six months that his brain didn't work the same way as the guys he was working with Studying with, so he switched to engineering. He went into mechanical engineering, got a degree in mechanical engineering. His first bit of work, he was working for Atomic Energy Canada, and they stuck him in the machine shop, which is where he got all his machining skills. Uh, 
I know him very well because he worked with me and for me for almost 30 years. Uh, he was at, at work, he was the uh, Alberta government specialist in building electric, mecha build, build, building mechanical control systems. He, uh, he, he not only knows mechanical systems in and out, but he also can program an assembler. <laughs> quite, a, quite a unique set of skills. And he, he worked directly under me for about eight years. So we, we've become good friends. Uh, he's got an amazing skill set. <laughs> well, thanks for that great backstory. I didn't realize that, but I do want to point out the spot welds here. Yeah. And the very smooth welding that took place here. So Yeah, that was done by Edmonton Fabricators. <laughs> so at, at any rate, so... So uh, they don't mess around in Edmonton. They're pretty, uh, no. pretty hardcore group. So, <laughs> what does this component do? Oh, that's the azimuth drive wheel. It's a friction drive, a, a roller on the outside to rotate. And the one on the top left there—that's the sector wheel that drives the altitude. It's an altitude azimuth scope. They're bit, they're building their own mount, basically. Oh yeah, building the whole scope actually, <laughs> except <laughs> the mirrors and no, Roman. In order to put the scope in the dome, don't they need to get a crane out? Yes, they. He, Roman figured out it'll just fit through the slit in the dome. The, for those who don't know, uh, the dome actually used to belong to the University of Alberta. It was on a site out uh, west of Edmonton at Devon, and they were going to uh, take that out of service. So basically, the club in Edmonton got the 18-foot ash dome for the cost of transporting it off site to where it's now. And they've built an observatory about an hour and a half east and a little bit south of Edmonton, at, uh, at a south of Riley. Uh, they have the building built and they have the dome on it. We got the trailer from U of A as well. So a little control trailer that will be off the dome. That's ready to go. We're just waiting for the scope to get finished. The mirror was donated by a member in Edmonton who has subsequently moved to Victoria and is now a member in Victoria, Bob Drew. And Bob's been to several of our Astro Cafes uh, yeah. uh, when we were meeting in uh, person, in person. at uh, Sir James Douglas School. So that's great. Well, thanks very much for that, uh, that uh, background on that in the instrument. It'll be quite the wild party when they have first light there, I'll tell you. Well, we'll keep you informed as to progress as things go. <laughs> Now, uh, Joe uh, sent you, a, I just wanted to say a few more things about the, uh, the Takahashi. It's a 130 millimeter um, uh, refractor here, but uh, when you're looking at it, the computer area is over here. Uh, what we have here is a, a focuser in the center to move the secondary back and forth. And there's a, uh, some wires here that will connect up to the motor and uh, we have ordered a, a control device so we can actually use this to uh, focus the um, system if we have to and it can be used to actually auto focus it. Um, on the, uh, the, uh, the Takahashi, uh, one thing uh, I'll point out now is that there's a lens cap here and the, uh, the deuce cell is so tightly sealed that uh, Mike Krampotic said that he has to pull this lens cap off to, to make this thing slide easily or else it's kind of vacuum sealed in there. So remember to take the lens cap off if the Dusa shield is uh, um, uh, uh, kind of in a situation that uh, you have to move it forward. The other thing is, is that um, we're gonna be able to um, adjusted a little bit more for, for balance, but uh, we have also obtained approval, and I haven't got a picture, uh, but we have a really high quality feather touch focuser that was used with our previous scope, uh, the um, PPO scope uh, that we bought from OPT, a 16 inch Richie Krechan, and we just could not get it to work right, and we shipped it down to OPT, um, um, and uh, Matt Watson uh, 
very wisely got a lifetime warranty on it and they couldn't fix it. So we have, instead of another scope that we weren't too confident in, we got to store credit. And I was talking to OPT today and we have approval to get an adapter that will remove the Takahashi focuser and put the adapter that uh, was uh, the feather touch adapter that uh, was acquired. And this is a, a, an adapter that can take a fairly heavy payload of the camera and that. And it will also has a, a Starazona uh, micro focuser uh, that allow it to be autofocused as well. So uh, we are actually uh, recovering uh, uh, basically a $1,700 investment there by buying an adapter here. And so um, we'll see how long it'll take to get this stuff, but uh, exciting times for the VCO. And I actually took this scope out and rested it on a uh, step ladder just to have a look through it. And uh, the only thing I could look at was the Heartland landfill. So that was not too impressive an astronomical uh, target. So, <laughs> so there we have it. The other thing we could do is put on a, 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 a camera on this little spot here. So you could have wide field photography and one or two of these scopes. Well, this one possibly set up for either visual or camera use. The, uh, the other scope I didn't mention too much about uh, is the, um, this is an OGS scope that uh, uh, we acquired uh, recently through the good works of Gary Sedan. He got, uh, he learned about it in Arizona and um, John McDonald and I uh, got it for a very reasonable price and we've donated it to the club. Um, but it is a research grade scope and uh, it's got a very well figured mirror. And uh, if with the, uh, this scope, if we bought it brand new with a mount like that would be worth $55,000 Canadian. And then uh, this scope here would be an extra $10,000. So we've got a pretty decent set of gear up there and uh, I'm kind of stoked. And maybe later on, maybe June, skies will clear and we'll be able to even look through it. So, so that's, uh, that's it for me. So I've, I've gone on and talked enough about that. So I'll stop the share and turn it back to you, Chris. But Reg, tell us the weather. Are we gonna see the sky ever? Never. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it doesn't look good for the next little while. Uh, so what? Re yeah. Reg, are you going to uh, need that uh, finder scope on there? Or is it all going to be driven off the computer? Well, the uh, there is a question about that. I always think it's a good idea to have a finder scope from my oh. experience, but uh, they will do a good T point. Uh, uh, program on this thing so it points really accurate and uh, what they they have a bit of a problem because the in current configuration the telescope and the um, uh, finder are, are crowding the uh, the place where people sit down for the computer but once you point it at the sky instead of having it in this horizontal park position we'll have quite a bit more room around the to computer screen but uh, I thought uh, the Takahashi was the finder scope. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, the, the finder scope there is, uh, I think it's a seven by 50 uh, finder scope on that. And Reg is absolutely right. Once you get the scope lined up, you don't need a, you don't need a finder scope. So. I believe Dan mentioned that um, that would be one of the next projects too, is to make sure the scopes are um, aligned, probably needing to shim the uh, Takahashi a bit to get it to align with the other one. Well, the, the, the way that the uh, Takahashi is uh, attached is through uh, what's called the Lozmandy D-plate. And there are two adapters. This all came about, uh, uh, it, it, the whole thing is being serendipity all over the place. Like the scope, uh, the, uh, the getting the uh, 12 and a half inch Richie Krejcian was, uh, was very 
uh, a wonderful thing that really worked well for us. And Mike Kraponic very generously uh, gave us the scope at below market value and it was pretty much exactly what we were considering. So that came along. And then I was trying to figure out a way to attach the clamshell uh, thing to the Lozmandy mount. And I looked in our cabinet and I found two of these adapters that I thought we'd have to buy and we we're gonna possibly get rings and stuff like that. And so I went to um, Canadian Tire and got a couple of bolts and this, that, and countersunk some holes and <laughs> filed down some things and we were able to attach everything really well. And it came with a little tiny uh, deep plate itself. And it just so happened that it had pre-drilled holes that were the exact center spacing uh, that were on the Takahashi um, uh, clamshell. So we're talking horseshoes here. This thing just all came about magically. So it was relatively easy to uh, find a way to attach this thing to the, uh, the um, uh, Los Mandy deep plate. So. Very good. Um, I just have, if Dave wanted to just comment on it, just as we mentioned it, here is the photo that was not in the, um, uh, oh. in the set on the website. Mm -hmm. So you can see the center cut out of the uh, wheel. That's an oh my goodness shot. Yeah. yeah. That's uh... There's even blood all over the place. That's how bad it was. <laughs> it looks like it, doesn't <laughs> it? Looks like it. So now he's going to have some uh, flat bars that are going across, and and he as, as he said, he has he figures he's going to be able to get that done fairly well. The, the biggest problem is his sixteen by sixteen thread per inch by he's got like sixty four screws. He's got to drill and tap into those two pieces of material, the cross plate, cross braces, and and the wheel. So he's got a little work set out for him yet. <laughs> Oh, I, I just had to drill four uh, holes and cross uh, and tap them. So he's got an eight times bigger job than I had. So there you go. Yeah, it's, Kids, don't it, do this at home, whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> or anywhere else for that matter. Yeah. Dave, that 32 inch mirror was, uh, was ground by Barry Arnold, wasn't it? It, absolutely. It was <laughs> actually ground twice by Barry because he had a problem with the figure the first time around. And then he had to take it back to Sphere before he could, to uh, before he could figure it. But it, he actually got got it to his acceptable uh, tolerances, which for most uh, mirrors is at better than sixteenth wave. Yeah, I have a Barry Arnold. I had two Barry Arnold mirrors. That my my ten inches my ten inch mirror is a Barry Arnold mirror, and it's better than sixteenth wave. Mm -hmm. He said, Barry said it was the best 10 inch he made, ever made. And I'm really, really happy with it. I was very sad to hear of his passing. Uh, two yeah. Years ago now. yeah. What, four years ago? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah, there were lots of members in Edmonton who are the beneficiaries of uh, Barry's work over the years. Anyway, I've got to uh, step out, so uh, see you all next time. Thanks for coming, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. I could actually throw in two bits about a couple of things. Uh, if we're... Please do. Okay. Um, I know there are a lot of Lunar fans here, and I would just like to remind everybody that uh, if you're around 50 years ago, you were avidly following the progress of Apollo 14 on the way to the moon. And it was the third uh, landing uh, expedition to the moon. And uh, it uh, landed at Fra Moro, which is actually where Apollo 13 was supposed to land. But the main thing, um, and there's plenty of stuff on the, uh, on the intertubes about Apollo 14, I also have an article about it in the January, February issue of Sky News, uh, a, a, a brief overview and a, a couple of photos. I actually wouldn't give the uh, crew from Apollo 14 the prize for great photos uh, while they were there. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, 
later on this year, we'll be marking 50 years of Apollo 15, which is still my favorite landing site, but that's another topic. But we are now in February, and this means that three new spacecraft are arriving at Mars. Um, and uh, on February 9th, uh, the first spacecraft from the United Arab Emirates is getting there. It's called Hope. It's going into, it should be going into orbit around Mars. And then uh, the next day on the 10th, uh, we have a Chinese orbiter uh, 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 arriving uh, uh, arriving at, at Mars. But, um, and of course, there's already a number of orbiters already there, but the, uh, the, uh, the big event is on the 18th, which is uh, when uh, the uh, Mars rover, I think it's, uh, this one's called Perseverance, which is even bigger than what we've had before is arriving there and we get to uh, uh, enjoy the seven minutes of terror as it uh, goes through the, uh, through the atmosphere and goes through its various phases. So uh, um, I'm actually not sure what, what time that is, but you know, I, we can maybe talk about that, uh, you know, uh, uh, two weeks from now when we're a couple of days away. Um, well, 12.30 p.m. 12.30 p.m. Pacific? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. But while, you know, while we're sitting here, um, you know, enjoying this uh, hideous weather um, and, uh, and, and you're looking for something to do, um, I'm just going to uh, make a suggestion here. Uh, can you see this, uh, this screen yeah. I put up? We this can. is a, yes. This is a series of terrific documentaries that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has put on their website. And I'll put the, the link to this page and the, the text in, in a second. But there, it's like, uh, how many are there? There's, uh, there's a dozen documentaries about their, uh, their spacecraft. Galileo, which went to Jupiter, and um, this, this one here, Breaking Point, is a fascinating one. It's quite a long one. Most of them are about an hour. This one is about an hour and three quarters. This is about uh, 1999 when they all failed. But uh, anyway, um, there's um, uh, To the Rescue talks about JPL's role in Hubble, uh, Voyager. These are these are these are great documentaries to help get you through uh, a, a lockdown when the, the skies are, uh, are 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 covered with clouds and uh, and uh, destination moon of course is about the early uh, the uh, the uh, robotic spacecraft actually that went there. You can see uh, one of the Apollo 12 people standing next to uh, 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 surveyor there. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a good way to, uh, to uh, kill some time uh, while we get through this, this, this wonderful uh, uh, weather here. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. That, that's that's now on my list. Um, it's like yeah. an interesting collection. I would like to just jump in here for one second and say, Chris, uh, I've been reading your book. I'm halfway through it. I'm totally fascinated by it, and mm. uh, I'm learning so much. So thank you for an excellent, excellent book. Okay, well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I've just put that link up on the, the, the chat. I'm actually, one, one thing I'm doing to kill some time now is that I have a very brief section in the book, maybe a page or something like that, about uh, the time that uh, amateurs were given access to Hubble. And I'm actually writing a much longer version of that section, which I'm going to uh, publish in JRASC uh, later this year. So, uh, um, uh, so. Uh, it's kind of forgotten now, but uh, there was actually uh, 12 uh, observation proposals from amateurs that were accepted 
for Hubble in uh, in the early 90s. So uh, um, anyway, that's that's what I've been up to. <laughs> well, thank you again for that. Very interesting. I just wanted to mention, I'm not sure if people see the chat coming up, but Quinn also mentioned in the photograph that Red showed us first of the neighborhood, uh, Uranus is in that photograph as well. That's been recently, uh, I don't know which one it is, but uh, so there's actually some more solar system. <laughs> it looked like uh, Earth and Mars were going to have their own conjunction quite, quite soon. Yeah, for, certainly from that point, I think. Exactly. <laughs> Is it? So I don't know if we have anything more for this evening, but um, that turned out uh, to be more more happening than I had originally thought. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you all. So if there isn't anything else, a reminder: we'll be here next week. We will be taking a family day off, and then our meeting after that will be the annual general meeting. So. Uh, there are three uh, Astro Cafes this month. Okay. Thank so, you, Chris. Take care, everyone. Hey, good night. Thank good night, you. everyone. Good night. Good evening. <laughs>